if you have some mental health concerns, if you feel hopeless, helpless and carry some guilt and shame. It is highly advisable for you to contact a mental health helpline in your country of residence. Or better still, go to see your primary health care provider like a GP and share with them how you feel. But if you feel so distressed before, during or after this program, call your local emergency line. For example, in Australia, this is triple zero and in America is 911. And remember, God loves you and so do we. Next station, Adventist Reflections. To discuss character building ideas, here is your host, Dr. Denzi. Hi, family. Today we have another Biblical Psychology episode. We explore matters related to psychology, Christianity, and mental health. We specifically speak about attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and how seeking help could change your life. To speak about this, I have with me Ryan Becker, and this is an interview that you definitely want to hear. Ryan presented himself as he is, humbly sharing his experience being diagnosed and treated for ADHD. I interviewed Ryan a few months back and I could not wait any longer for you to be blessed by his story, the story of his journey. Enjoy the ride. Today I have a very special guest. Uh, he is well known in the podcast world in Adventism, and that is Ryan Becker from Absurdity with Ryan Becker. So, Ryan, welcome. Thank you for accepting uh, this interview. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. I am thrilled that there's a podcast out here in our faith community that's talking about mental health and um, and psychology. Like, this is really cool. Well, thank you, Ryan. So when I thought about the idea of doing this podcast, I honestly thought that there were not many people out there who would be willing to talk about it, especially if we're talking about personal mm -hmm. experience. So I'm very happy that you were willing to. I think it will be a good idea for us to uh, understand who you are and perhaps where you're coming from in, in, in this arena, especially for those of, uh, who listen to us who might have not heard yet about you. Tell us, what do you do? What do you exactly do? Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, I graduated from Southern Adventist University in 2015 with a theology degree. I was nice. um, going, I had the plan to go into ministry. I would never considered my calling pastoral. It was more just, I want to be in ministry. I want to serve people right. and uh, as a career. So chose theology, did that. I got picked up by the Carolina Conference in the U.S., so I am, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee currently, but uh, for two years I worked in South Carolina as a pastor. I pastored two churches, two small, very rural churches, and then moved back in September of 2018 to work at Southern as an admissions counselor and ministry coordinator for enrollment, so I recruit for Southern and I operate some ministries that we, that we run out of our office. In addition to that, I lay pastor a local church in the area, Crosswalk Chattanooga. I host, I host three different podcasts. Um, I'm in the middle of a, uh, I'm in the middle of a Kickstarter for a news aggregator for Seventh day Adventism. Um, that's running till July 9. So full speed ahead on that right now. And, um, so basically I don't have any free time and I love it. Wow. You know, I I have listened to your podcast, but I didn't know you did all that. Um, I didn't even know you were a pastor to start. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. There that, you go. Pretty good. Yeah, you, you must not have really any time to sleep. I don't know how you're doing this. Well, how do you do it? Well, okay. So A, it helps that I'm not married. Um, okay. I do have a dog. I've seen it. About it. So, 
Yes, and I don't have uh, I don't have so I don't have obligations outside of really whatever I want to do. And it also means that I don't have financial obligations outside of myself too. So it's kind of freed me up with time and a little bit of disposable income. But um, I am hoping to get married at some point. But for now, I'm making the most of the fact that I have time. So that's part of it. Um, the other thing is I'm passionate about all of these things. And so I've made space for them in my life. I've prioritized them. And, and um, actually, as it turns out to our conversation, um, this kind of behavior and someone being involved in so many things is actually pretty typical for the issues that I deal with. So, um, yeah, so it's actually a part of it's actually been a it's become a part of my struggle without me even realizing it. Right. Maybe we should go there at the end of the day. This is what the podcast is all about. Let's go to the origin of things before we go on to your personal struggle, if you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first thing that I would like to have your opinion about, perhaps theological opinion, since you're a pastor, or perhaps just, you know, a human <laughs> being, a nice human being, um, personal uh, reflection about the thoughts between the link of what the Bible as we know and have, and, and psychology, is there any link at all? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the, one of the main things for me that is, um, that I've realized recently is, look, Adventism is great with its health message, but it's not holistic. Um, right. um, in that very often we are, um, we assume that your psychology or that your mental health is completely like all your problems are solved if you would just eat right. And mm -hmm. while a lot of your problems are solved if you eat right, it's not at all true that all of them are. So um, I do think the Bible really does speak to mental health issues. I think that in, and in psychology as well, um, there's a whole lot of things that you can see in the way that, that Bible characters interact with each other, uh, the way they process information. And you can absolutely see um, you can see people go through really deep valleys. You can see people um, that can obviously very continually struggle with addiction, um, which is a mental health issue. It is something that psychologists also um, address. This is like psychology is everywhere in scripture. Uh, and I think I really wish someone would would kind of do some studies on the psychology of God. Um, and, <laughs> right. and dive into that. I don't know. I, I literally, that's an off the cuff suggestion, but I think it'd be really cool for someone to dig in from that perspective and investigate God and the scriptures from that kind of point of view. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think there's a couple of things that catch my attention. Definitely the idea of studying the psychology of God. Uh, I wonder what limitations we would have, but we have a lot of things. I mean, if, we do believe that the Bible was left for us to understand God. We should have enough to be able to dissect his psychology, the, the way God perceives Yeah, a little God. bit. Yeah. It will always be bigger than anything that we can come up with, but sure. it, it, it's, but that's true of any opinion of God. So it is, it's something to kind of just help us get to know him better, I think. Yeah, for sure. The other thing that catches my attention is this idea that we do claim to have a health message and we do have one and we, it seems to be a good one, but there are things, you mentioned there are things that are missing, you know, like if we write, everything will be solved out, but yet we're missing a link, like if we're missing something or perhaps we have dismissed it almost as if, as if there is a fight between realities of life and the message that we have embraced for more than a hundred years. What do you think about that? Yeah. No, I think I think we absolutely have dismissed it and I don't I think we dismissed it not out of spite. I think we dismissed it out of out of pure or good intentions. Right. Uh, the intentions being that we had this understanding of faith in God as a solution to problems right. rather than a vehicle to persist through problems. Hmm. And so because it was a solution, then any issues you were faced with, you said, we said, pray more, have hmm. more faith, bring it before the community of God and, and have them have faith for you um, and pray for you. And we, and while that is a good part of that vehicle it is it, it it doesn't mean it's a solution to the problems because what we what we watch is now people are dealing with mental health and they pray and pray and pray and nothing happens and there's got to be something there if god is continually just it's seemingly ignoring the prayers of this entire group of people that are struggling with mental health with their own mental sanity and and issues these families that are torn apart by it um, and these personal lives that are just uh, thrown into chaos, uh, it seems almost like uh, it, we were kind of forced into it. 
And now, um, now we have, uh, the church has, has kind of gotten to a point now where we just kind of assume now it's because you don't have faith. And it's turned now into an attack on someone instead of an encouragement to say, hey, we should really pray about this. It's saying, no, you are suffering because you didn't pray enough. And we've made it a causation instead of something to be done alongside. Right. I can see how many people have a struggle with the idea that if I am a Christian, therefore I should not be struggling with this. And if I pray, I should be delivered from this. And we might, as Christians or as Adventists, perhaps as you're mentioning, we might have been stuck on this idea that that's all everything that we do need. Um, after all, you know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. That's that's a mantra that we like to yes. play all the time, don't we? Yep. All right. Maybe we'll go to the benefits after. Let, let, let's 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 dissect this idea that we're getting into, you know, uh, because it, it does happen, and it's an unfortunate thing that is happening within our um, w- within our Adventist world, and even in the Christian world. You know, I have many patients from who are not really Adventists who do go through the, the struggles that we are having as Adventists, but because the Christian world see it the same way, especially when you're talking about fundamentalist Christianity. So. You do have a very personal experience. You do have a very personal journey that uh, resonates with you in the sense that we're talking at you. Hey, you pray and everything will be fine. So what I mentioned at the beginning uh, in the intro is that I I have listened to your podcasts, um, but also the one thing that caught my attention is as I'm reading your Instagram, um, you mentioned in one of your stories very briefly uh, that... Um, that you have, go- you have been going through this journey. And so I would like mm-hmm. to know what exactly is your journey? What what happened? When did this happen? How, yeah. how did it take place? Yeah. Um, so a few, a, a few years ago, kind of when I started pastoring and um, needing to really sit down with my members and, and have um, kind of in-depth conversations with them and try to get to know them, right? This was, this wasn't like a job requirement, but it was, it kind of is, but it, it was really, I wanted to know the people that I'm going to church with, that I'm doing life with. And so I'd sit down over lunch, over dinner, whatever in church, and I'd, I'd talk with people. And I'd realize that like, I thought up until recently, I thought that I just, I guess I didn't care enough or whatever, because I, ca- I kept catching myself drifting away in the middle of telling them, telling me stories and telling me about themselves. And so it, it started to turn into me kind of actively almost avoiding a lot of those conversations right. um, and withdrawing because I was like, maybe I don't care. Like, maybe there's something wrong with me that I just don't care enough about them. And I started to notice in sitting in board meetings that I would I would fidget a lot. I would move around a lot. But because of the specific nature of my church district and that and this like the circumstances around it, um, I had a lot of downtime. I had a lot of time where I worked out of my apartment. I didn't really go anywhere. So I never thought more about my symptoms because they only came up once or twice a week and I didn't worry about it, right? I was just like, whatever, I don't know what this is. Maybe it's, I I do remember having the thought, like maybe I have ADHD, but I'm fine, so whatever. Um, And uh, I kind of let it go. When I moved back to Southern and started working uh, working here again, now I'm in a full-time job, 8 to 5.30 every day, um, sitting in meetings alongside coworkers, having to sit at my desk all day and get work done. And I started to notice those symptoms exacerbated a lot more because now I was in, I was comparing how I behaved to those around me. Um, I started noticing that my voice, uh, was a lot louder than those around me. And, uh, we always joked that it was the half Cuban in me and the, the, the inner Hispanic coming out that I would, that I would be loud. Um, I started noticing in meetings that I would I would shift in my chair a million times in a minute, but the person next to me was totally fine. And I I started noticing that um, I would have to get up after every hour or so because I just couldn't sit still. And actually got to the point I, I realized that I hadn't even read a book in over two years. Um, I hadn't read, finished a book. I had tried. But if things didn't get done, if I couldn't finish the book, basically in that first sitting when I was the most excited about it, then it wasn't going to ever going to get finished. And so I stopped buying books. I stopped reading books that affected my devotional life uh, because I, I, I didn't want to read uh, because I felt like I couldn't focus. It felt like um, it felt like the that moment where if you've ever tried to hold your breath as long as you can, 
um, right as you're getting to the very end, your body starts to kind of shake and you're like, no, I need to breathe. Okay. That's me. When I was reading, um, I, after X amount of time reading, I would start to feel that motion. I had to put the book down. I had to close it. I had to get up and move. I had to, um, I had to do something else and it was just too struggling. It was too frustrating to, to fight through. So I just gave up. And so I said, you know, I think there is something wrong with me and, uh, this isn't okay. So in early March, uh, I decided to call a, I looked up a psychologist, found the only one that I could in my insurance network. Thank you, private health care in America. Um, after about an hour of searching, found a psychologist that dealt with adult onset ADHD, um, got an appointment, had to wait a month for that, basically. Um, so March 4 to March 29, I just waited. And then March 29, I went, sat through a initial kind of behavioral interview with the psychologist. And I remember leaving um, and I was shaking and I was relieved and I was angry. And here's why. Uh, first of all, it felt amazing to have someone affirm that my experiences were out of my control, A, um, because I didn't know what was going on, and B, um, yeah, I felt amazing to be affirmed in that and to know that, okay, my hunch was right. There is something wrong. Like, this isn't normal. I was, I got to the point where I was beating myself up because I thought like other people just dealt with the issues I'm dealing with and figured out a way through it. And I didn't have enough discipline to deal with it. Um, I thought the, like, I thought I was the problem. And, uh, but I was angry because what I realized was as we were talking and as I learned more about ADHD, um, I realized that this is a, this has affected me my entire life and we just never realized it. Um, it affected my relationships. Um, it affected my classwork. It affected why I chose the major I did. Um, I w originally was thinking about law school and when I was in school doing theology, I was wondering how nursing majors spent so much time studying. I couldn't do it. Um, I would, um, I would, I would read a line in a book and I'd be able to write a book report and I'd think, man, I'm so smart. No, I wasn't. I mean, I have a good writing ability, but what it was is me compensating for the fact that I couldn't write, read the whole book. Um, and so, uh, it turns out that natural aptitude, I got lucky in that sense, but natural aptitude covered up a multitude of my symptoms so that I never noticed them. And, um, so I was angry because then I was, I thought how much of my life would have been better or different had I known about this earlier. And so it was this weird conflicting emotions of like relief, um, to be validated and affirmed, but anger to be like at what was stolen from me. Um, went back a month later, got tested. And then about a week later, I, we went through a, a number of like little written and computer tests that a week later, I got my diagnosis officially mild to moderate ADHD. And the next day I went to a primary care doctor and got a prescription. Um, and I don't want to say what the prescription is, um, only because I, it's not that it's personal. It's that I want everyone to talk to their doctor about what's best. And I don't want to influence that. Um, but the, um, let me just say this within two hours of starting that medication, my life was completely different. Um, I, I sat through a haircut for the first time without, without shifting and fidgeting all the time. Um, I drove a 40 minute drive home without biting my nails the entire time or feeling the compulsion to, um, it felt like someone like wrapped me in like a warm weighted blanket or something. Like I just calmed down and then I realized what calm felt like. The next day I sat down and edited a four hour or, or edited for four hours uh, of the video that we used for our Kickstarter without having to move or get up. And, um, it was incredible. Uh, within days, people noticed, they said in 30 seconds, within two minutes of talking to someone, he said, yeah, I've already noticed that you're fidgeting way less. Um, it affected my, within a day as well. Here's the other thing. Um, I was drinking two monster energy, two cans of monster energy per day, 32 ounces of an energy drink every day. And psychologists told me like that you were self-medicating to get through the day. When I started this medication, I was able to cut the energy drink out overnight and, um, and without any issues, without any caffeine withdrawal. And so the, the health issues that ADHD has, like the, the medication has helped me with is a, I'm no longer drinking a ton of like terrible chemicals from an energy drink, uh, twice a day. I'm drinking a lot more water. I'm drinking, um, or I'm eating less and I'm eating like, I'm eating less when I do eat and I'm eating less frequently. I used to eat super late at night and I don't. Um, I drink a lot more water. 
And if I want to drink some caffeine, like get a latte or a coffee with someone or just drink an energy drink because I like Monster, um, I can have one, but I um, I have to be careful about how I exactly. And so it's just everything about my life has just completely changed in the way that I perceive things, the way that I experience things. It's night and day. Um, and I have several moments. And this is I'm talking to you about this basically nine days after I started medication maybe nine, 10 days after I started medication. And there have been several times just in those 10 days where I've been brought, almost brought to tears uh, at how different my experience actually is now. It's incredible. Uh, I'm absolutely speechless in the difference that it's made. Right. So what I'm hearing is that your whole life, you have been struggling with something that nobody knew you had that you didn't realize that you had until you started to self-reflect. You started to observe your behaviors and compare it to uh, the masses or to the most people. And you realize, hang on, mm -hmm. why am I going through this? And most people are not going through this. And um, and then you went to see somebody. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the idea of seeing somebody? Do you yeah. ever struggle with the perception of, hey, you know, I don't need to see somebody or um, this is shameful or if my church will know that I'm seeing the shrink, perhaps they will not think that I am uh, the good Christian that I am. I don't know. Yeah, um, I used to years ago think that um, think that that seeing a, a therapist or uh, a shrink, psychologist, psychiatrist, you name it, right? Whatever your word for it is. Mm. Um, I used to think that that was that was difficult. That was that was something of was a stigma. I had a stigma against it. Um, over the past several years, God has really softened my heart to it. And maybe he softened my heart to it for specifically to save me, mm -hmm. but he, he softened my heart to it as I, here's honestly, here's, here's what made the difference. I have a family member, uh, that has two different mental illnesses, borderline personality and, uh, yeah, borderline personality and bipolar. Wow. And that family member has been going to therapy for years and it seemed to not be working for them. Um, in many cases, but there were a number of other issues that as I realized that realized why her specific situation was that way. And, um, but honestly, seeing a family member struggle with mental illness was one way that, um, opened me up to, um, the willingness or the option to get help. Uh, the other thing is I'm surrounded by, I got lucky in that I'm surrounded by friends and, and people in my community who don't stigmatize it. And so, um, that has been helpful, but honestly, like, this is strange, but in many ways, I do praise God for those that were brave enough, courageous, courageous enough, you name it, to to actually leave their faith communities, because it is the people who've left who've told us, like, you, the way that you're behaving is toxic. The way that you're viewing mental health, the way that you're viewing these issues that we're passionate about is is wrong. So we have to leave. That, that forced the church to go into crisis mode. And while I don't, I'm not saying praise God that people left the church. What I'm saying is praise God there were people that were brave enough that by their lives uh, challenged the church and caused us to move forward. And I think the church is now shifting and culturally shifting to a position where we are more open to that conversation and more open to those discussions. The other side of this is I think the internet has helped us with that too. Mm. You're not stuck in your silo mm. anymore. You can connect with people that also may be experiencing the same struggles and issues and you can, you can connect with them and find common ground with people now. For sure. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think we are shifting. I think we're moving perhaps a bit too slow, but uh, we are moving and we were not moving before. Yeah. And when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I, a lot of the times I tend to withdraw or say, I just work in a hospital and that's it. I move on or whatever. And um, mm -hmm. my wife is my witness. Every time um, I said, I am I'm a psychologist. Uh, people withdraw. Perhaps they think that I'm analyzing them. I don't know. But a lot of people say, like, how do you resonate your job with your Christianity? I mean, you're an Adventist and you're, you're doing this stuff. You know, Freud is, is an atheist, whatever. But um, perhaps my latest way of saying things, as I was in the Philippines a couple of weeks back, some people asked me about it. And I said, well, you know, most of our Adventist institutions have a psychology course. Uh, even in some of the theological seminars, they have at least one subject to do with psychology, yet we are very slow in embracing the idea that we are human beings. We are not just biologically, made socially dependent in many ways, in the spiritually driven, but we have a psychological aspect. They have a mental aspect that we don't see and we tend to ignore because we know who sees the mind. Nobody sees a mind walking. We just see the brain, we poke it, we probe it, 
but the mind is such a complex thing. Also, we believe, and it is, and therefore we don't touch it because it goes into the realm of the metaphysical. You know, if we don't see it, we don't want to touch it because, you know, maybe we are mm -hmm, playing mm -hmm. some kind of God. Um, you know, it, it, the idea of medication is one, it's a good aspect, I think, Ryan, because a lot of people... Um, perceive that we should not touch anything that will interject between our functioning, uh, our, our neurological function, our brain functioning, and uh, and God. Uh, and I have heard that before, and I would like to, to think about uh, that a little bit, as well as the aspect of faith. Uh, a while back, I was talking to my brother. He he lives in Loma Linda, and, and he was sharing with me a case of somebody. Of, we won't go into names. Um, he was living elsewhere at that time, anyways. But um, a very well known preacher who who came to one of the youth uh, conferences, very well known in Adventism, and and they there they was this friend of his who has been struggling uh, all his life with bipolar. As this person talked about the idea of health, faith, and relying on Christ, and quoting the usual verses that we all embrace and and give us a strength in our faith, he th then mentioned that that should be our full reliance uh, on. And, and so this guy thought, well, I'm going to go and find some counseling from this pastor. And so he came, he talked to this person, um, and, uh, and this person said, look, um, you need to stop taking any of these medications. These medications are making you no good. They're making you a zombie. They are making you uh, to mm. uh, disrupt your relationship with God. Your frontal cortex is the one that we utilize to pray, to talk, to whatever, you know. And so bottom line is this person goes, listen to this guy, started to study the Bible even more, stop his medication and ends up in an array of struggles. Uh, basically ends up in detention and in jail. So because of his bipolarity, I mean, in the manic states of my, of mine, he couldn't really control his doings. He didn't have a sad mind. He needed this medication. But some people still struggle with the idea of medication. How do you see the perception between medication and faith? Is there a, <laughs> is there a medication versus faith? Or is there a, hey, medication can be part of your faith? What do you think? Are you lacking in faith? By saying, hey, you know, God, you are not good enough to settle my mind and deal with these attention deficits and hyperactivity issues that I have. And therefore, I have to find somebody else's resources. Mm. I think that to see medication as not a part of God's work uh, is to see other people involved in your care also as uh, not a part of God's work. In other words, if you don't, be if you believe that God can work through anything to accomplish His will, why would medication not be included in that? Mm. And I think what psychology did for us is psychology showed us that sin has much deeper effects than we thought, and we can actually identify them through the chemical imbalances that are present in someone's brain. The idea that medication disrupts a connection with God or doesn't make us who we are um, actually. This is this is something that to me uh, it's based off an, an assumption that everyone has the same brain or everyone's brain is going to work the same way and that's just not true is what we what we're finding and what medication actually did was it did it did what every single miracle in the Bible did and that's this the purpose of every miracle that Jesus performs that's a healing miracle is not necessarily just to make the person better it's also to give them access to God. Because if they were sick, if they couldn't move, they couldn't go to the temple where God was and worship him. They right. weren't allowed in. Right. So God's miracles, Jesus's miracles were for the per explicit purpose of giving people access. What medication, especially within the, within the context of psychology, what it has done is it has allowed people to actually experience who they're supposed to be, which means it's actually increased their ability to access God. Uh, their, their opportunity to access God, because there isn't this manic voice, this manic side that is completely distracting you from from God it, that's pulling you away anymore. Um, it, it's controlled. And I think that medication very much in modern medicine in general is a way is the is the extended healing ministry of Christ. And I think that's why you actually see less healing miracles now, other than that, we all have access to God via wherever we are. Um, but also um 
it's because we have developed modern medicine and I think God's hand led in that. And I think that, that a lot of the healing miracles are done with the hands of doctors and nurses and, and administrative staff and, and, you know, record keepers, you name it. Uh, anyone who is, uh, anyone who's involved in the medical field in any capacity, um, they are, they are very much the hands and feet of Christ. And this is now how they choose to be those hands and feet. They could choose to use those gifts for evil. And there are some that do, um, for profits. And, um, there are ways that people take advantage of others, but, for the most part, I do believe medicine as a whole, like, hey, look, if we're trying to avoid anything that uh, that disrupts who we are, then that takes any pain medication off the table, whether it's Tylenol, ibuprofen, anything that messes with any anything in your body, you can't take. Um, and at that point, well, then I, uh, you know, it, it, at that point, there, I may never as never see a doctor again. It, like, it's a slippery slope. If you start banning some, um, then where do you stop? Hundred percent, I agree. You know, and we never hear that. I have mentioned this before in in the podcast and and uh, through some interviews with other podcasters that they have uh, done uh, with me, and um, the idea that we never see somebody saying, "Hey, you know, don't go and and and, and take um, a Panadol of uh, ibuprofen for your headache." For your muscle ache, don't go and take the aspirin to thin your blood so that you don't get a blood clot and have a heart attack. Everybody wants to see their family lim- member live and live a good quality of life, and so does God. But nobody seems to say, hey, you know, go and take this medication that will make you feel better. will allow your chemical imbalances in the brain to be somehow more balanced so that you can have a good quality of life, which is what at the end God desires for all of us to have. Some of us in our Christianity circles or Adventism they seem to be holding back a lot, perhaps because of the perception that they don't believe that mental health issues even exist, or they're related to the idea of faith. So I like what you're saying there. You know, I, I like a quote that you recently gave uh, in your Instagram because I think it's a, I think it's a good one. I think it brings part of this point uh, to life. And for those who are listening, I recommend you follow um, Ryan on his Instagram. It's absurd.ryan. And in there, he says, you, you mentioned that you were preaching to a, in, in a church recently. And, uh, and, and you said this, we love God best by loving others. And then it doesn't finish there, which is what I like. And then it says, we love others best by loving ourselves properly. And I wonder whether you, you know, the idea of, you know, this idea of medication or looking after your mental health self care implies that sometimes we might do a disservice to us if we have this perception that we cannot look after us by sometimes even taking medications of people who God uses to serve each other in our communities. And therefore, we're not really experiencing the love for other people because we're not loving ourselves. And therefore, we could query the idea, we could question the idea of, whether you really love God, if you're not really looking after yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, th- I actually found this in a comment on Reddit and, right. and it's it's become the, the way that I changed my life. Uh, it, it like it literally did change my life. It basically said that the greatest act of service you can do for your friends is to go to therapy, uh, is to not depend on your friends for your mental health sanity. Um, your friends are and your family. They're not qualified to deal with the issues that you're dealing with. And they've got their own issues. But imagine if you had a person that was in your life specifically to deal with your problems. That's what therapy is. That's what a doctor is, right? That's what a, that's what a psychologist is there for. You are paying them or, or whether it's taxes or whatever, you're paying them. And, and their position in your life is specifically to care about you in this area. If you depend on your friends, your friends, like they can only do so much. Um, so the best thing that you can do is to take the load off of them and to get help from others. I'm not saying you can't depend on your friends, but there's this idea in Galatians two, or Galatians, I think five, it might be six of, um, of bear, carrying one another's burdens. Um, but each person also, but then at two verses later, it says each person has to carry their own burdens. And I, I think a friend of mine, Henry, Henry Johnson, he would kind of explain this to me. And he said, if you go back into the original language, um, this idea of carrying one another's burdens, it wasn't that. It was uh, lift one another up because each person has to carry their own burden. So the role of friends in, in the community in your life is to encourage you along the path of you carrying the issues and the, the struggles that you have to carry. Your friends can't carry your struggles. Only you can. 
um, with the help of God, obviously, but your friends can help carry you, um, but they can't solve your problems. And so go, so it's this supplemental or complemental, complementary, complementary uh, relationship where a therapist helps you actually face your struggles and your friends encourage you along the way. Um, but the best thing you can do for the people in your life is to get the help that you need from someone who's qualified to help you. Right. I think that uh, that is an important aspect. I'm going to ask you at the end a little bit more about that, because I think it's a very important aspect of um, the people who are listening to this podcast. The idea that um, it is important to take charge of your health, to take responsibility, to take control of of your life and living. I think the idea always comes under this perception of we cannot help anybody. We cannot serve anybody unless we can first serve ourselves. And there is, I have, I have listened to a lot of patients in the past, uh, well-meant patients who, who perceive that I'm not to look after myself. I'm not to go and see anybody. I was reluctant to come to see you because you know, I need to be out there serving somebody. I need to be out there helping somebody. Uh, I don't have time for me time. One of the things that I talk sometimes during during therapy is the idea of me time. Uh, and, and, and we unpack that idea. Maybe later on we'll talk about that uh, in this podcast. But um, me time is an important time. Uh, we cannot help somebody else unless we help ourselves first. Mm. Um, we, we, mm. I think um, as we're wrapping up this idea, I, will, I think it will be unfair if we don't talk about the benefits of Christianity and maybe even Adventism. We, we talked a lot about some of the disservices that we have done throughout the decades uh, on this aspect of mental health and Christianity. How has your Christianity, your, your Adventism helped you uh, in your mental health issues. I mean, af- after all, you you were an Adventist way before you took medication, and somehow you managed to the best you could. Now it's way better since uh, since March, mm-hmm. um, but you have done, you know, you have accomplished a lot of things, and and perhaps you mentioned that uh, the struggle that you were having is directly related to all the things that you're involved. You know, we talk about how crazy your life schedule sounds to be with all the things and the ministries that you are involved into. Um, but um, how, how has, what are the benefits in your personal life um, that you have drawn from Christianity, from Adventism? How has it helped you with your struggle in your, in the mental health arena? Mm. Um, I think the first thing that it's, it's helped me with is the understanding that um, even when I was so limited by this, um, God was still using me. Um, God still loved me. And, um, and this, and in seeing, um, in seeing people in the Bible struggling with these things, um, in seeing that I, you know, I, I do, I firmly believe this, it it isn't a, it is somewhat of a speculation, but I firmly believe that the only reason that Peter survived after betraying Jesus where Judas didn't is that Peter never left the, the other disciples while he was in grief for his betrayal. Judas, when he betrayed the disciples, he left, he was on his own. But Peter was surrounded by the community, and when Jesus appeared, Peter was among them. And so, um, seeing the way that the the that people in in the Bible and in the scriptural narrative have survived and and kind of wrestled with their mental health and their emotional health um, has been an encouragement to me to know that that yeah, God still uses and and loves people even in spite of that. Whether it's through narcissism, whether it's through depression, whether it's through addiction, whether it's through um, I, you name it, um, it is it is amazing to see that and to see that Jesus was freeing people um, from possession that very much mimicked what mental health is, um, if not and and mimicked the, the many of the the. Uh, symptoms and of mental health, uh, mental or mental issues. And so, yeah, that was a huge encouragement to me. Number one, um, number two, this idea of, um, Christianity, what Christianity did was provide me with structure, um, which is incredibly important to anyone dealing with any sort of mental health issue. Um, there's a, there's regularity involved in the Christian life. There's patterns, there's rhythms of, you know, with, with, a, with Adventism specifically, the Sabbath, um, the Sabbath, you're putting away everything. With ADHD, the reason I'm involved in so many things is that's what ADHD tend to do is because we get excited about something, we dive in, and then we, before we know it, we have all these different things that we're trying to juggle um, because we, uh, we've we gotten bored with something after a while and we want something new, but we don't want to leave the old thing. And um, 
that is that is something that I've dealt with. But the Sabbath makes me pause all of that, and it's always made me pause all of that. And so, um, the with that and that's specific to my Adventism. Um, the yeah, the idea of the Sabbath and, and my beliefs have helped me understand that um, that uh, there is a time that I can put away this stuff and just take care of myself, and that is important that I rest and that I recover and that I figure out what that looks like in my life. So those, those would be the, the ways that, that Christianity has benefited me in this conversation. Um, beyond that, it's also benefited me in the way that I talk to others um, as well, because it gives me some solid biblical foundations to talk to others about taking care of their own health. Mm, thank you, Ryan. So many things that you said just there that would make this interview to go on forever, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things that could be unpacked there. I mean, just from the idea of um, of how the disciples struggle with certain things and the benefits they go from Christianity, from their social niche, the circles, the support that they gave each other, the regularity, but also the idea of this demon possession business. Back then, you know, you have a cri- someone with a crippled hand. Now we have surgery and we can help people with crippled hands sometimes. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. miracle happened. But now we have different things that might resonate with this idea of demon possession and men- mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also another aspect that I think would be pretty cool to unpack, but not today. And then the perception that indeed Sabbath is specifically in Adventism. And, you know, there are some people out there I know for a fact that listen to these who are not Adventists, who are just Christians. And and I respect that. But um, you just mentioned the idea of Sabbath and taking that that time, that uh, appointed time by God to rest. And, and it has helped you and has given you a, a structure and an ability to, for example, for ADHD to pause. And I have seen that in other people with different mental health illnesses, you know, people with depression who obviously are struggling to even show up to church. But because we have this regularity mm. and this mm. structure in Adventism that we kind of like don't miss it, mm. um, they still carry through and they go and even in the depressive state of mind and the imbalances in the serotonin, dopamine and all sorts of neuro- neurotransmitters, they come to church and they get some benefit on that time uh, as they are participating of church activities. And then they go out of church and they remember, oh, you know, uh, my life sucks kind of thing and I have to struggle with it and I have to fix it and I have to do whatever. But it does bring benefits. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. I, I really yeah, do. Yeah. Um, look, we, we'll wrap up, but I would like to know, is there mm, anything mm. that you would like to specifically share with people out there who might be struggling with something? It could be ADHD. It could be any other mental health concern. And who are thinking, hey, you know, I, I don't want to see somebody because, you know, if my pastor sees me, he's going to think that uh, something. Or if somebody else sees me, the elders are going to bring me to the to the board and put me into some mm-hmm. discipline of some mm-hmm. kind because I'm, I'm heretic. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What what message do you have there for, for people who might be suffering with a mental health concern? Um, the first thing I would say is a lot of people that are, I think, that are struggling with mental health concerns, they try and brush it off and say, well, I'm doing fine. I've been fine up to this point. And that was something that put me off of getting a diagnosis too, was this idea, like, I, I was doing all of the things that I've mentioned on this podcast before I got my diagnosis. I was developing a, that, the news aggregator and getting ready for the Kickstarter, um, for seven months, but I just got my diagnosis 10 days ago, right? I, like, these are all things that I was doing. Um, what I realized was if there is even a chance that everything I'm doing could be easier or better, then I should take that chance. Because worst case scenario, I can just stop anything that they've asked me to change and I can go back to the way I am if I know that I've been able to be successful to this point. But if there's a chance that it could be better, I'm going to take that chance. Um, so that's the first thing. That was the logic that kind of broke me out of the, ah, this is good enough cycle. Um, I can do this cycle. Um, the second thing I would say is if your church community, this is, this is actually an, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to quote Ellen White because I, I, I know it's in, uh, testimonies volume 12, but I don't remember the, the specific page it's on, but she does say this. She does say, um, if, if in churches, pastors are not demonstrating the love of Christ and who Jesus is, then she actually says, take the youth far away from the church. It is better that the youth not be in church than to be in church and exposed to pastors who are not properly being the example of Christ and loving people like Christ did. And, um, so there's an, there's an element where, where Ellen White, who in Adventism is a major figurehead, a major teacher in Adventism, and she herself advocates for removing people from church if church is going to be harmful for them. Literally this idea of leaving church to save your faith. So, 
Um, I would say if you're in a church where the pastors, where the members, where the elders are going to do that to you, um, I would say that maybe the diagnostic, the diagnostic process is, is, is going to help you find the real community that's going to help you build yourself, build your faith and, and, and encourage you on your journey. But if those aren't that, then they're not the community that's loving you the way that Jesus should love you. And if that's the only community you have and you love them and you don't want to lose them, I fully understand that. And I think then, um, part of the, the journey that you're on now is one of educating those in your life. And understanding, um, what is, what you, what, and, uh, and helping them to understand who you are, what you're dealing with, and, and how they can be a part of that journey. So take that, champion it, and own it. The last thing I would say is this, this is the biggest thing that has helped me in accepting all of the things in my past that I can't change. Um, and it's this. With my mental health issues, I've, I've come to understand that something that happens may, it, it, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. Um, and the things that happened in the past, they weren't my fault. I couldn't control them the way that I can now. But now that I know, that it's my responsibility to prevent that from happening again. ADHD people rush into relationships, and then after a month, they're like, eh, I'm bored, I want to do something different. The number of people that I hurt uh, with that kind of behavior, now I know what the source of it is and the root of it is. And so now it's my responsibility. And so um, this is my life, and I'm going to own it. Um, I'm going to be the person that Jesus called me to be and that Jesus is now empowering me to be. Um, and so, yeah, those, the things that are caused by my, my symptoms may not be my fault. Um, they may not be what I would have chosen to do, but they are my responsibility and I'm going to own that and I'm going to live in that. Um, so I would, I hope those things are encouraging to someone, uh, who's kind of in that, that gray area of like not sure what to do next or fighting with themselves. Um, I, I would encourage you to get help and, and to find people that will support you in that journey. Excellent. If you were preaching and we were in a church, I would shout amen. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, it, it's good. So, you know, give the benefit of the doubt. You know, you never know what you are missing out. You can try. You can always go back to your original. Try to be a champion. I like that. And I think that what, that's what I call my attention from your championing as I saw your Instagram post when you talked about your experience when you started this journey of, of recovery, of healing, of, of getting better, of taking medication, doing some treatment of some kind. And, and I guess also, you know, for those people out there who might be listening to this, who are in the super conservative side of things, when they think, you know, all you need to do is Jesus Christ, read the Bible, have faith. That is one of the greatest aspects, one of the greatest things that we could actually embrace. I believe it. I live it. I will not be in church otherwise, but also let us think about the other avenues that are out there that we could utilize to help our church members. So great to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ryan, for sharing your experience. I mean, it takes a lot. Uh, you are very open. You're very see-through. I can see it. If you were able to see, for those of you who are listening, if you were able to see Ryan as I'm looking at him, he, he speaks with such passion that um, you, if, if you cannot hear it, I, I don't know what else will will do it. Uh, unfortunately, this is a <laughs> podcast, not a video channel. Uh, but one day we might do a video. We'll bring him back and we'll do the, whole, the thing all over again. Um, sure, I'd love to. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, what what are you up to now? What what is what is? Tell us about your projects and what uh, you mentioned about this new stuff. I have read about it actually, and I think I read yeah. about it not even on your podcast or your Instagram. I read about it before I even got to know that you existed um, a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. So t tell us a bit about um, what what's Ryan going to do now. Yeah, so um, I'm going to continue in my podcast work with um, with Absurdity, theabsurdity.org, as I can find that. I'm on iTunes and kind of everywhere else. But um, that 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 podcast is kind of geared towards people who are questioning their faith, doubting their faith, and, and helping them deconstruct some of the issues they face, encouraging them or affirming when they see things that are wrong and, and as we call them out. Um, so a little bit more difficult conversations, but I host absurdity. So that's never going to stop with uh, this news aggregator project. Basically we realized that um, the news and Adventism is really hard to engage with and keep up with because there's so much of it and it's so long. And so a friend and I realized this and, and um, basically have created a way to aggregate that down into one short and condense it down into one short article that's, that's meant to be a weekly roundup of the news to help catch people up to speed in about five to 10 minutes um, and then be able to, to stay engaged and informed. And we link back to original articles so that you can dive deep on whatever you want to dive deep on. Um, so that's what we've been developing. We call it the scratch. Um, and you can find that in the Kickstarter for it by just going to the scratchnews.com. Um, and, 
Um, we, yeah, we have a team of, we've, we've put together a team of almost 20 people that are working on this completely volunteer. And even if we don't fundraise our goal in the Kickstarter, they're going to continue working on it as are we, because we believe in it so much. Um, so that's the newest thing that we're trying to do, um, is, is the scratch project. Other than that, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing, keep on keeping on with what I'm working on. Um, I'm going to, um, keep working at Southern and loving my job there. I'm going to keep lay pastoring, um, and loving my church community. Um, Crosswalk Chattanooga is a church plant. Um, and so it's incredibly exciting to be a part of that process with everyone and with some really close friends as well. Um, yeah, I'm just super grateful to be, to have the opportunities that I do, um, and to not waste, uh, one of the complaints I had when I was pastoring and didn't and had all this downtime was I started to feel bad that I had all the downtime. And I said, I don't want to waste my 20s. I'm 26. I don't want to waste my 20s uh, sitting around. I want to do. And now that I'm back in College Dale at, at Southern, uh, I'm doing. <laughs> I'm busier than ever, and I'm so happy, and um, it, it's incredible. And I'm just so grateful for every opportunity I have to have conversations like this for the work that you're doing um, and uh, every opportunity that God gives me to serve his people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm sure that you're going to succeed. I mean, I have seen you succeed in the very little that I know you. So it sounds that a lot of things you're doing with passion and for service and uh, to help other people as well in the way that you do things. Now, um, just to finish, I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot or if you accept anybody, random people, uh, any random people to follow you, but social media, can anybody follow you on social media? If somebody's out there saying, hey, yeah. you know, I think I have ADHD, I think I have a mental health problem, I want to talk to this guy, I want to know more, um, how can they contact you? Absolutely. Um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. You said my my username earlier, absurd.ryan. You can follow me on Twitter, Ryan180Becker. You can find me on Facebook. Um, you'll find a man with a beard and a green T-shirt. Um, and that that's me in College Dale, Tennessee. Um, you can find me on, on really anywhere. Um, and I'm always happy to talk about this stuff if someone reaches out. Um, you're welcome to send me an email, Ryan180Becker at gmail.com. I'm always happy to talk with anyone. Uh, the only thing I'll say is sometimes my phone doesn't let me know when people message me on social media, especially Instagram. So if you DM me, um, just give me, uh, give, be patient with me. Uh, sometimes I forget to check and I actually have to physically check when someone messages me. Uh, like I have to check to see if someone has messaged me. It doesn't notify me. So it's just some weird bug with my phone. But yeah, um, I'm always happy to talk. So reach out to me any way that you want. And I'm always happy to, to pray with anyone, encourage anyone or, or and listen to anyone. Nice. Thank you so much, Ryan. I just want to say, Ryan is not making that up. The same thing happens with my Instagram. It doesn't send me messages. I don't know. It must be an iPhone thing. I don't know. You have an iPhone, but it's mine, does it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's I don't weird. know. Anyhow. It's weird. Anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to um, this interview. We spoke with Ryan Baker from The Absurdity with Ryan Baker Podcast. Uh, it was a great interview. I really appreciate Ryan's um, experience and transparency. I'm very humbled to listen to his story and I hope that you were blessed by it. And uh, remember, reach us on Facebook, Instagram. We're always on your most common social media as Adventist Reflections. And until you hear from us again, I'll keep on loving God. What about you? Remember to subscribe to this podcast, like it, share it, hashtag it, comment, and find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Tumblr as Adventist Reflections. God bless you.